welcome everyone to Society 2045, our Friday calls. We host these calls to explore and curate uh, positive visions of what the world might look like in 2045. I recently read a couple of books by Bob Johansson of the Institute for the Future, and he says, you know, it's actually easier to look out 10 or 20 years and get a sense of what's going on than it is to look out a year because there's so much dross in the way, you know, on the immediate horizon. It's like, how do we get past this? So we're going to make the assumption that by 2045, the world is actually on a way to a, towards a healing path and that things are working pretty well. Of course, there's still a lot of work to go, but George, I'm going to ask you, uh, before we get going, if you would please um, just give us a brief glimpse of who you are. I know that's a big question for someone of your extraordinary background, but just if you can encapsulate who you are today, because I know Fast You Tomorrow will be different, but who are you today and, and what brings you here? Well, I appreciate that you ask uh, who am I today, because depending on when do you ask, in which context, I always have a different answer. So I would say that I'm just another human being who is trying to better at playing uh, in collective intelligence researcher, developmental trend, ecosystem catalyst, emergence curator, uh, evolutionary mentor, independent scholar, and so on. For today, um, well, uh, I'm an explorer. I'm an explorer in uh, space, uh, that uh, I'm passionate about, which is the space, space of uh, the company of uh, fellow evolutionaries. And uh, I'm also very grateful to uh, Jose for having invited me because uh, Society 2045, uh, given that you want to create a more robust voice for change, and so do I. And I really just enjoy every opportunity when I have a chance to engage in a collaborative inquiry about how to do that. Uh, and I hope this meeting may lead uh, to something like that, like a collaborative inquiry. Thank you, George. Um, you were very involved in something called knowledge gardening. Can you tell us a bit about that and, and where that is today and where you are in relationship to it? Yeah. You, know, you may remember how knowledge management became the latest fad in the US management circles after, after the delayed of lots of people in the 1980s. And when the corporation realized that with the people walking out the doors, their uh, knowledge and expertise has also walked out. So they invented this knowledge management, trying to capture the knowledge by letting people go. And of course, knowledge management is an oxymoron because uh, you cannot manage knowledge what exists between our two ears. Uh, so in response to knowledge management, uh, I developed the knowledge ecology uh, discipline, created the Knowledge Ecology University, had the, that was on the web, and uh, I designed and hosted a Knowledge Ecology Fair. It was a virtual fair on, on the web. Uh, I, I remember having received uh, phone calls, we had about, 400 knowledge professionals gathering for a month. And uh, I received phone calls from people who, who asked uh, whether I can recommend a hotel nearby because they couldn't imagine that we do this uh, on, the, on the web. So uh, the, as part of the translating the knowledge ecology discipline into practical use cases. Um, I developed community knowledge garden for client systems as well as for uh, the, the School of Commoning. So the School of Commoning uh, was a community interest company that we founded with Anna. And the school doesn't exist anymore, but the website and the knowledge garden does. Uh, so if you go to schoolofcommoning.com and click on the knowledge garden, then you will have a 
a very early, very rudimentary version of knowledge garden nowadays, uh, when I am thinking of knowledge gardens, um, I'm thinking of a more uh, using Web3 uh, tools and uh, such uh, hypermedia note-taking and knowledge organizing tools that Obsidian, and uh, so a knowledge garden is, I would say, the infrastructure enabling uh, collective intelligence to emerge. Uh, it's not sufficient for collective intelligence because that's just the infrastructure piece and collective intelligence comes from collectives, from communities. But the knowledge garden is an important enabler because uh, without uh, relying on knowledge ecology and its manifestation in knowledge garden, it's very difficult to imagine large scale collective intelligence. What's collective intelligence to you? How would you describe it? There are many, uh, many definitions. Um, one is just translating um, what intelligence for uh, the functions, the functions of intelligence for the individual, translating it into um, collective uh, dimension. But uh, so there is a mathematical definition, there's a uh, wisdom of crowd kind of thing that uh, it's focused on the capitalist uh, directives of uh, predicting. Uh, market outcomes and stock market by making a kind of inventory of uh, in some of individual predictions. So that's not the collective intelligence that I'm uh, thinking about and working mm -hmm. with. Uh, for me, the collective intelligence is uh, a capacity, an emergent uh, property of uh, collective entities to uh, shape uh, their, uh, the path, shape the path to their desired future by using uh, such um, evolutionary mechanisms as uh, differentiation, integration, and uh, so that, that does involve uh, the using uh, of such um, possibilities as uh, having uh, collective memory, having mm -hmm. uh, collective self-reflection, sense-making, and not just sense-making, but uh, choice-making. So all that is part of uh, collective intelligence. So that opens up a whole bunch of things in my mind. Um, sense-making, I really appreciate your coupling sense-making with choice-making because I don't often hear that uh, woven together. I think that's a really critical distinction. And uh, it sounds like there's, there's both, how do we get the creation of memory, which has a lot to do with archiving. And so that's kind of on the web and, and combining computers and people to increase our capacity. There also seems to be a bunch of um, human practices, relational practices that are necessary to bring forth collective intelligence. Can you speak to that at all? Harvesting or archiving uh, doesn't uh, create uh, memory because just as memory is not stored in our brain, at any particular location, but that's the wonderfully complex interaction of many patterns of uh, neural pathways. Uh, so uh, we can store documents in the knowledge garden, but that doesn't create collective memory. The collect mm -hmm. because that's just knowledge, uh, even less. That's just really just information as long as it is on a paper or a screen. Uh, it becomes knowledge when uh, people uh, do something uh, with it. And it becomes 
collective memory as an enabler of collective intelligence, then we start weaving. And weaving is a collaborative action. To give you an example, like um, in any well-designed uh, knowledge garden, uh, we will have hyper trails. The hyper trail is um, a series of links that reflect my path in the knowledge garden, the path that I am pursuing for a purpose that I'm pursuing when I want to explore something or when I want to create something. And those hyper trails are recorded, but they are recorded not only for my pleasure, they are available to all members of the community and they can relate to, uh, I can, uh, they can borrow, they can use, I can use their hyper trails. And uh, more importantly, it's also the, combination of uh, what is asynchronously available and our real time conversations like, like this, like uh, no, if we would want to uh, develop a collective intelligence of this ad hoc community, then we would start with questions. What is important for you? What do you care about? Uh, what do you care for? How can we support each other? And it is in this caring, it's, it comes from collective intelligence really comes from caring. If I don't care, then why would I want to be part of anything like that? Mm. You remind me of David Cooper writer who says, um, it's way more important to ask not what's what's wrong and who's responsible but rather what matters and who cares mm, right absolutely right. yeah yeah i love time thank you that's just it's lovely to, to hear someone talk about collective intelligence and caring in the same sentence i don't often encounter that so uh very refreshing uh i'm just gonna i'm gonna go to a different topic if you don't mind i was looking over some of your links that you sent me and um you're working on something called um enlivenment theory of change. Can you tell us uh, about that? It's a good uh, segue because to the caring because my enlivenment theory of change uh, came out uh, from my caring. So what do I care about? Uh, what do I care for? Uh, caring starts with, it's, it's a universal human attribute. Uh, in the sense that we all care about something and even about somebody else, except the narcissistic sociopaths who care only about themselves. But caring is not only human. For example, mothers feed their children in all mammal species uh, and wolves care about other members of the pack. So well, human caring starts with our capacity to care for not only our closest kin and friends, but also having a moral imagination that inspires our acts of solidarity with the disenfranchised who can't meet their basic needs. So when my care grows even deeper and wider, then I start asking questions like, what would it take to change the system that turned them into disenfranchised humans? And what is my best chance to contribute to that change? So, you know, I'm a radical sociologist and both by training and passion and uh, a, a radical sociology takes as its goal, human emancipation. And that can only be the result of emancipatory enlivened social movements driven not by ideologies, but by our profound desire to let more aliveness, inspiration and practices worth replicating flow through the channels that connect us. So my enlivenment theory of change is a fresh concept but the life-giving forces that it aims at amplifying is not new at all. 
I don't know whether you saw that uh, essay about the enlivenment theory of change on Medium or at Emerge uh, website, but uh, on both of those papers, uh, there is a little graphic showing the embedded systems, how enlivenment scale, uh, scales up and down, how at the foundation, is uh, enlivening uh, oneself and then building on that enlivening our relationships and enlivening our systems or society. So it scales uh, up, but it also moves the other direction because uh, living in, living and working in an enlivenment and enlivened society uh, will obviously give a better chance to have all our systems, all our institutions enlivened, which well, in turn leads, enables us uh, as individuals have more aliveness because our environment is more vibrant. Enlivening is one of my favorite words. Uh, I use it in regards to listening of, you know, when you listen, what do you, what do you listen for that's alive in the conversation that moves you forward that like, wow, that's, I really have to think about that. And so let me ask you, where are you seeing uh, examples of things coming alive that are giving you hope? Decentralized autonomous organizations it's quite amazing the intensity of social creativity that gets liberated when uh, people have a chance uh, to work and collaborate without bosses, when they can uh, participate in the ownership and the governance of social organization, how I notice that enlivenment, you know, I am participating in the Discord platform in uh, quite many conversations in and around uh, the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organization. And I just notice the enthusiasm and the creativity with which people are creating. Uh, basically, they are creating the enabling infrastructure, the infrastructure that some pundits think of um, those are the future of work uh, or uh, the future of organizing. What I see is that those decentralized autonomous organizations are the future of decentralized autonomous society. And we can already feel the enlivenment, the flow of inspirations, co-creation that is happening in those spaces. Very interesting. And uh, related to this, I also saw that you have uh, some um, writings on enlivening value flows. How does that tie into all of this? Just like uh, collective intelligence, uh, needs uh, some enabling structures. Uh, so enlivenment is uh, not only a flowery term, but it also needs uh, uh, structures for being able to uh, assess, not necessarily measure, but at least assess uh, how are we more or less enlivened at a given time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concept of the value flows uh, helps uh, with that. So the value flows is also drawing uh, on the work of Sally Gurner, a scientist who developed the energy network science. And uh, so the, the value flows uh, are the channels uh, in which uh, we spread uh, 
or inspiration or new practices. Uh, uh, the val value, the value that flows includes also trust and mm -hmm. uh, financial resources, uh, as it happens in praise and uh, things that uh, we value and the channels through which uh, they spread uh, need to be deepened, widened, uh, connected, uh, like uh, our individual uh, intelligence depends not as much on how big brain the, we have, because then probably the elephant would be the biggest, the most intelligent being on the planet, but it depends on how well our nervous system is connected, how well the nervous system is reaching out in all parts of the organism. So for the enlivened uh, organization, enlivened community, those value flows uh, need to reach all parts of the organism. I also have to tell that um, this whole um, enlivening value flows is, is a, a very early stage of a generative action research. So my focus is turning uh, this uh, concept into something that is uh, operationalizable so that uh, we can develop uh, plans and action of uh, how we can more enliven, not uh, just as individuals, that's another question, but uh, how can we more enliven as organizations and social system? Of course, this starts with the individual. And if I'm just thinking of myself or my friends, uh, how can I notice whether I am enlivened or not? It's quite simple because um, when I feel that uh, my head, heart, and hands are connected, that it's all aligned, uh, then uh, I'm also more connected with my team, with my environment. If there is a something uh, rupture, something broken in my own enlightenment uh, that results in uh, not feeling the alive connection with my uh, colleagues, my environment. Uh, so uh, it's easy, easy to notice. If we get these enlivening flows deepened and connected and things are going well, what might things look like in 2045 from your perspective? What do you see as the big trends that are shaping up to be, this is really gonna be very useful 23 years from now? I read in the Zoom invitation to this event, join us to learn more about George Moore's vision for the future. Well, I'm afraid, uh, but I will disappoint you all because I am not one of those pundits who offer a word saving vision. And if you follow it, everything will be all right. I even refuse to give in to the temptation to have a vision of my own. Of course, as a leftist student leader in the 1960s, I used to have a vision for the future where all problems are solved. But uh, since then, I realized that even if I had a vision, there is something way, way, way more important than that. It is the vision embedded in the practice of social movement working for a radical change. So instead of um, offering a vision I offer something more precious. 
a passionate call to study and engage with the most forward thinking social movements from which the real vision will emerge. I am, I am more like you in the sense that I do not really know what the future has in store for us and would love to find out. And I have a way to go about it, which may be of interest to, to some of you. Someone early on in the introductions mentioned that they're here because you're an elder. And uh, I love that term. I, I would like to bring that term back into common parlance. I think it's missing from our, our world that you know we need youth mentors and elders are part of a continuum. So as an elder, as someone with a long history of social innovation and, and an entrepreneurial and enlivening spirit, what do you see that's really behind that's, that's going to be nourishing and useful and enlivening for the people coming after you? I used to uh, agonize about legacy issue. Now that I am ready to move to the other realms, it's not my time yet, but uh, having developed uh, a lot of um, frameworks, tools, methods. Uh, I guess my hard disk has a uh, half million uh, files accumulated over the dec decades. So that's my research library. And so I, I used to uh, think about with some anxiety that what will happen to all that? It will go in the tomb with me and so what? So what? Uh, no, I am more in a, yes, I care about my legacy, but not as much in terms of what uh, have been the products of my mind. Um, but um, you, you said uh, something earlier about, in relation to collective intelligence, about relationships. If I think at all about a legacy, I think uh, the most important is the relationships. I have the quality of the relationships because people will long not remember anything that I have written uh, or said, but they may remember the love that I felt, uh, the love that we shared. Uh, and. Um, of course, I am interested in uh, any uh, potential influence uh, for uh, a better world, but I think that it will come uh, through the communities that I help uh, building. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, way of holding the question of legacy relationships, community. It also helps me with the, with the question of the knowledge work. How do I bring my uh, knowledge work uh, into play, into play for something that can be useful? And what I'm, what I notice is that uh, in those half million files uh, that fortunately, but it, they are totally disorganized because it's a patchwork. The folders within folders, I couldn't find anything by just navigating through the hierarchical folder structure. Uh, but because um, I have uh, like, on every harvest we have the keyword searching. And so, as I am working on current projects, current projects that I care a lot about, uh, I mine my personal research library and pull out pieces as they become relevant. So that means that a um, lot of what the content is there uh, will maybe never, will probably never will be used, uh, but uh, what will be used is in response to uh, what is needed now. And uh, I have a, a secret uh, aspirations that uh, 
someday soon when I will be able to afford to hire a knowledge gardener uh, that uh, I will put the content of my hard disk somewhere on a hard drive, uh, which of course is still unusable, even if it's publicly available, but the knowledge guard, I would give some guidelines to the knowledge gardener how to try uh, to make some uh, order out of that madness. All right, thank you so much, George. It's been a pleasure. I'm gonna open it up for questions. We have a lot of uh, people here uh, today. Who's, who'd like to ask George a question? Jose, I see you have your hand up. Uh, um, so George, you, you don't like to um, predict the future, which is, I think, a, a smart thing to do or not to do, I should say. Um, but what, what do you hope for the future? How, how do you hope the future will uh, emerge over the next 23 years? Um, next how many? 23 years. 23. 22, 23, uh, whatever it takes to get to 2045. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, I hope that you ask the uh, next two, three years uh, because uh, one of the fallacy about that kind of long-term uh, even hope is that uh, we have no clue of the galloping, galloping uh, socio-technical innovations and their second and third order cross impact. Uh, so I am not a technological optimist. I am not a technological pessimist, but I do know that uh, the productive forces of human intellect that manifest uh, in the technological changes will create unfathomable uh, conditions for what is to be human in the next few decades. Um, so uh, yes, uh, if, if I uh, dare to have a hope, uh, of course I would uh, love to see uh, anti-fragile, non rivalrous uh, society that is self-organizing and uh, becoming uh, stronger in its self-organizing practices by every challenge thrown at it. But that's way too abstract to make uh, any practical use of it. Uh, I am following uh, a couple of philosophers uh, who try to answer this kind of question, but they also shy away from long-term predictions. Uh, the best uh, is to uh, indicate uh, directions in which we would like to see things unfold. And uh, that direction is what I try to capture with uh, decentralized self-organizing society that is anti-fragile. Matt, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I have a related question to Jose's, but I'll ask it a different way. So not predicting the future, not forcing a particular vision on people is the human thing. To, I mean, it's the right thing to do, um, unless you're a psychopath. Uh, but what are the foundations? You, you talked about directions, you follow the right this direction should be in a better place. Uh, where do they start from? What are the foundations that you would see in place that would lead us to a better, in better judgment, but, but a, a more human, humanistic kind of society? Now, thank you for asking that. I, I see a, a system of conditions 
more precisely, an integral system of conditions. Uh, because as technology is moving so fast, uh, it can lead to very dire consequences unless uh, our consciousness is catching up with them. So one of the uh, conditions is the uh, accelerated development of individual and collective consciousness that will not happen by itself. It will happen only if uh, all the people who care about that particular condition for a better future are engaged in uh, self-knowledge uh, leading to self-development. Uh, so consciousness is, is one. The other, other condition is a more partnering type of behavior, patterns becoming more prevalent, at least a significantly large part of society rather than uh, sustaining the competition-based uh, behaviors. And, and then of course, there is the cultural uh, dimension where uh, the self-organizing communities where new culture is being uh, developed. And last but not least, uh, the transcending the hegemony of uh, private property, transcending the hegemony of capitalism. Uh, so I'm not talking about a post-capitalist uh, society because I believe that even in 25 years, capitalism will be still around, uh, but it will not have the monopoly over our life because uh, parallel with the capitalist uh, system, there will be the commons oriented peer production growing up. And the condition for that is when uh, the commons and the decentralized autonomous organizations learn how to out collaborate, how to out cooperate the legacy systems, the corporations. And that's a big, that's a, not a trivial issue because uh, corporations have uh, all the money and the power that goes with it. So where I, um, invest my attention uh, is an, a number of different things. Uh, the working on development of consciousness for which uh, this uh, spring we will start uh, a learning journey at Campus Coevolve uh, with the temporary type title uh, enlivening uh, the flows that connect me, we, and all of us. And uh, in the connecting to me, a big part of it, that will be consciousness development, capability development. Uh, and the other area where uh, I try to make a difference uh, is uh, keeping a strong attention and holding space for the possibility of the DAOs and the commons learning how to out collaborate and out um, coordinate the legacy systems. And of course, uh, I am too small to make any difference for that, but there are lots of people who are working in that area. So I am uh, supporting them, learning from them, and uh, yeah, learning through interaction and collaboration. That, that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Bring us all together.
Michael, I saw you give a thumbs up to George when he was talking about capitalism losing its hegemony there. Did you want to have a question? Do you have a question or other comments about that? Yeah, sorry. Um, did I thumbs up? Yeah. Um, it was just this, it just, you know. Cap capitalism sucks. <laughs> it really is it's a serious competitive knife fight. And it seems to me that the possibilities for the emergence of a collective intelligence are highly dependent upon us stopping knifing each other at every transaction. I, I, I'm personally convinced that we need a method of interacting at a person to person, at a person to commerce, you know, where I spend in a store or pay my taxis. It's better to do it with a cooperative tool than a competitive tool. Mm -hmm. And we've been isolated in a collective unintelligence mm -hmm. by the, the, the segregation separation that, that money has made it absolutely necessary for us to play with. I mean, you don't look after yourself, buddy. I'm not going to look after you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in any of my interactions with you, there's this underlying question of, am I taking a slice out of you? Are you taking a slice out of me? This is not, not a good basis for trust. I always return to, can we cooperate? And I think that requires not just a moral change. In fact, I think moral change is about the last place we're going to get. You know, people are not easily changed morally, but you can change their behavior very, very simply. A little diversion sign on the freeway and everybody turns left. And if, if we make it more satisfying, productive, easy to cooperate, and experience the difficulty that competition is bringing on us, then we, we've got something to play with. But I, 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 I also think it's, it's a question of doing it unconsciously. My sense of the transition from the I of society, my, me, you, the segregation, to the, the we-ness, the collective, is that it is not a conscious process any more than a flock of birds plans its murmurations or a herd congregates in a particular way it's from our actions as individuals that the collective emerges as as a thing a thing we may never understand and certainly not not with this bit so uh, michael you raised a couple of points that uh, i would have a lot to say about it but uh, now we are getting to the end of our time. So let me just uh, tell you all that if you want to learn more about the capability development journey for change makers this spring or our action research about the value flows, or want to get involved with our work in any way, uh, ask uh, Jose, uh, he knows uh, where to find me. And, uh, uh, if he knows uh, your, I guess he knows your email addresses, I can also send you a couple of links to videos and articles that goes deeper into what I was talking about. Thank you so much, George. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure to see you. We're complete. Um, we can stop the recording and hang out for a little bit for anybody who wants to talk for a little bit more, who is the time. Um, I don't have to get off right now. I don't know about George, but um, we'll have the after the after party now. So mm -hmm. uh, once again, George, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I have, you know, like it's the question about collaboration. And you know, especially at the at the social movement, and the, the collaboration that is required to actually make the transition we need. When I actually uh, look at uh, you know attempting to form collaborative environments, even with a group of twelve people, sometimes it just miserably fails. Mm -hmm. So for me, like the question is to to George, if you can walk into that knowledge garden. And if you can pull out some of the flowers of collaboration <laughs> that, are, that, that, that you're uh, aware of and familiar, and basically where is, if there is some sort of, in your opinion, the secret sauce there, 
and how can we scale that source up so that we can create more of this collaborative and collaboration across um, movements? Yeah, people first is uh, the key verb, and I would even add to it that uh, the most uh, powerful instrument to cause the change in the attitude of the people you want to collaborate with, the most powerful instrument is yourself, your precious self. And to be more precisely, uh, you more precise, that's uh, your willingness to go through a radical change personally. A radical change by from thinking with your mind to thinking with your heart. Because as long as you think with your mind, you create wonderful tools and methods. And then uh, you hope that people will use it. If you think with your heart, then uh, you become so passionately curious about the people you are working with that uh, you just love them. And love is not an emotion it translates into a profound attention to their needs and aspirations and becoming friends. When that happens, then chemistry, it, an interest in chemistry is coming into being. Uh, and then you also will respond to their needs with the right tools at the right time. And then magic will happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just heard Dave Snowden. You know about Dave Snowden's work, Cognitive mm -hmm. Edge, can I? He's talking about his work in the US at the moment to try and create some form of dialogue between the right and the left, the blue and the red. Mm -hmm. And he found if you bring their heads together or their hearts together, it's a bloodbath. Don't do it. You've got to get their hands together. It's got to be action. When there's a common task and people are engaged in a common task, then there is the experience of the experience of good work. You know, so it's it's always head, heart, hands. We've got to get into action on something. And it's the action that, that allows the modification of the head trips and the, the fear. It may be so, but if it's not led by the heart, it will not go very far. That's my experience. And I, if I, there is no action, there is nothing to show for it. So, so we, we need them all together. Leadership and follow, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. So heart, head, and heart, hands, and head. I am very sorry my friends, but I reach the saturation that I can stay on a, any uh, Zoom call. So I uh, respectfully bow. No off. worries. And thank you again for organizing this. Bye now. Thank you for joining us. George. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, George. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, George. <laughs>